So I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint presentation on healthy communication skills. It's a PowerPoint that I share with family members who have loved ones who are in residential treatment and everybody tends to find this information really, really um, helpful. So I'm hoping that you will too. And the information, the majority of it, about 90% of the information I'm sharing with you is based upon research that was conducted or has been conducted over the last 40 plus years by doctors John and Julie Gottman. I mean, basically they've dedicated their entire careers to studying relationships and some really wonderful um, information has come out of that research. And, and one in particular is this four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that's four communication styles where if these are present in your relationships to a significant degree, then they're creating probably some dysfunction in your relationship and not very healthy. And I'm going to go through each one individually to share you know, some in-depth information about each one and their criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And just to let you know, as I go through this information, you're probably going to identify with one or more, if not all of them, but as you identify with them, not to be too hard on yourself because we all do these to one degree or another, right? So I know for me, my biggest one is defensiveness and I have a tendency, like that's my go-to, I'll fall into that pattern of communication. So it's not about beating yourself up for, you know, falling into having this pattern of communication. It's all about awareness. It's about bringing to awareness, starting to be like critically aware of when you are engaging in these patterns of communication and then practicing the antidote. So I'm going to be providing you with the antidote for these communication styles, a way in which an alternative way for you to communicate other than the ones that, um, that are here. And, and just really quick too, I like to compare this, um, this practice concept, right? Like these are, these are patterns of behavior where we want to practice being critically aware and then engaging in the alternate behavior, engaging in the antidote. And I, I compare it to the four agreements. So if you're familiar with the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, it's these, you know, uh, four patterns, you know, that we fall into. Uh, it's based upon Toltec wisdom and they are be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. And through this book, Don Miguel explains how by practicing these agreements with yourself that you can really transform your life. And he says in the book that it's impossible to do these perfectly, right? We're always going to um, have that experience where we fall into not being impeccable with our word. And so it's not about beating ourselves up that we can't do it perfectly. No one can do it perfectly. We're human. And so the same applies to these four horsemen. We're, we're all human. We all slip up sometimes. It's not about that. It's about trying to do your best to practice recognizing when you are falling into these patterns and then changing your behavior. Because of course, as we know, recovering from a substance use disorder, whether you're the individual or the family member is all about change and looking for ways in which we can start to change to support successful recovery. So let's start with criticism. Criticism, I'm sure that you've heard the expression healthy criticism, right? Or constructive criticism. And truth be told, there really isn't any such thing as constructive criticism or healthy criticism because criticism is different than a complaint. So there, I, I think that what people mean when they say healthy criticism or constructive criticism is they mean they're expressing a complaint rather than a criticism because a criticism, like it says here on the screen, is we're attacking a person's character or their personality when we're criticizing someone. So a, a complaint is we're identifying the behavior that is upsetting as opposed to the, um, as opposed to criticizing the person. So the antidote for this is the, the Gottman's, I don't actually share on here what the Gottman's recommendation is. They, they uh, suggest a slow warm up, a gentle warm up, which means that you kind of like massage your, the, the person by 
saying something positive. You know, you say something positive before you express the complaint. And I just want to give you an example, right? So if you're kind of like sitting there going, wait, wait, I'm still confused. What's the difference between a complaint and what's the difference between a criticism? I'll give you an example. One of my um, tendencies is to leave lights on. And so I'm sitting in my office at home right now. And that's one of the places where I have a tendency to get up, leave my office and leave the lights on. And so my husband will come to me and he'll say, Kay, he calls me Kay, Kay, you know, you left the lights on again in the office. Could you please remember to turn them off? So that's a complaint, right? He's, he's not attacking me personally. He's not you know, a criticism would be him saying, I can't believe you're so lazy. Like you can't even remember to turn those lights off. And when are you ever going to remember? You know, I can't believe, like notice the change in my voice, the tone, the, it's much more about me as a person, like my, like I have some sort of defect or inability to remember to turn the lights off. And that's not the case at all. It's just a matter of, you know, sometimes I'll forget, I'll get preoccupied, whatever the case may be. So in the first example, he's just saying, you, you, you forgot to turn the lights off. Could you please remember to turn the lights off next time? No problem. It's the behavior. So a way in which you can approach that, if you, if you, if your loved one is someone who doesn't necessarily take um, uh, feedback very well and you're worried about their response to you expressing a complaint is to maybe do a gentle warm up or what I refer to as like my approach is the sandwich approach because I like to start with the positive and end with the positive and slide in the complaint in the middle. So that's the sandwich approach. Whereas the sl slow and gentle warm up would be just saying something positive. Like, you know, it would be, for example, my husband saying to me, you know, you know, I really appreciate how hard you work. And, you know, I know you're working hard and that you're distracted sometimes, but could you please remember to turn the lights off when you leave the office? So that, that feels different, right? It feels better because he's, you know, he's massaging, he's telling me like, I really appreciate you. I know how hard you're working and this and that. And sometimes in the heat of the moment, it's really difficult to do that. But that is the recommendation is that you use a gentle startup or use the sandwich approach. And then the next um, four horsemen is defensiveness. And like I shared with you earlier, this is my, I guess you would call it my, uh, my go-to. I want to say my favorite, but it's really not my favorite. I don't like the fact that I'm defensive. I think it's just a behavior pattern that I've, um, you know, I, I've gotten used to over the years, just something, you know, we, we establish these ingrained patterns in our brain, the neuro connections, just, you know, they get really deep and um, it's just a pattern that, that I developed. And now, ever since I, I learned about these four horsemen and became aware that this is not healthy and that, you know, there's a better way to communicate I, um, I try to catch myself when I'm being defensive. So what does it mean to, to be defensive? What it means is that when, when my husband comes to me, right, and he expresses his complaint and he says, you know, okay, you, you left the lights on in, in the office again, again, <laughs> could you please remember to, to turn the lights out? So if I'm defensive, I'm either going to um, express a, an excuse, right? I'll say, well, you know, I'm so busy and, uh, or, you know, one of the animals distracted me and I had to go do this. And I'm going to just, you know, make an excuse. And then the other way in which we can be defensive is if I were to say something like, well, what about you? You know, the, you, the, what about you? And when you do X, Y, Z, whatever it is, I use, I use, I know it's not necessarily, um, the, the most pleasant thing to think about, but I'm like, well, what about when you leave the toilet seat up? Like if I were to say something like that, I'm being defensive. And I'm what I'm doing in essence, right? Essentially is I'm not accepting responsibility for my behavior. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm negating it. I'm not, um, I'm, I'm defending and not taking responsibility. So this is just a, a, a quote about defensiveness is really, a way of blaming your partner, right? It's not my fault, it's your fault. You're saying, in effect, the problem isn't me. I didn't do anything wrong, it's you. And so defensiveness only serves to escalate 
the issue, right? We go from here to like uh, here and then here and then here. And then it just starts, you know, this escalation where it turns into this big, huge thing sometimes that it doesn't necessarily have to be. And that's why it's so deadly and it's so bad for, um, for a relationship. Bad, not a good word, unhealthy. It's so unhealthy for a relationship. So the antidote for defensiveness is to accept responsibility right? Not getting into this, whose fault is it? Your fault, my fault. It's taking responsibility. And what I've heard from some people is, well, KJ, what if like, I really don't believe that what that person is, you know, complaining to me about is valid? Like, maybe I don't think it's valid. And so I use the example of, let's say I, you know, I say to my husband, um, you know what, I, I, got up last night in the middle of the night and you left the toilet seat up again. And it was really very unpleasant when that happened. And, um, and so uh, maybe he didn't think that he did, right? So he doesn't agree that that's a valid complaint. Like he thinks, you know what, I didn't, I didn't leave it up. So a way in which you can take responsibility, but still, you know, still express how you truly feel is by saying something along the lines of, you know, I don't really remember doing that, but I promise next time I'll make sure to put it down. So you're like saying, okay, you know, I don't remember doing that, but next time I promise you that, you know, I'll make sure that, that, that I take care of that. So that's a better, better approach is to accept re responsibility um, or, or just express your true feelings about something without like counterattacking or making excuses or blaming the other person. And then the third four horsemen is referred to as stonewalling. And stonewalling can happen in one of two ways. And one way that stonewalling happens is what I call organic. And what that means is that you, when you're in conflict with someone, and I know that this has happened to me in the past many times, and it's escalating, right? And it's getting more and more um, emotional that what will happen with me is that I'll become what's called emotionally flooded. And I'll get to a point where then I just shut down and I can't communicate anymore. I can't even speak. Like that's how intense the emotional flooding is, is that I cannot even communicate anymore. And so that's one way in which um, stonewalling can, can happen. And then another way that stonewalling can happen, which is far more, I believe it's, it's, far more um, dangerous to a relationship. It's, it's far more damaging, I should say. It's far more damaging to a relationship is when you use stonewalling as a weapon. And what I mean by that is you are upset over something that your partner has said or done or loved one, doesn't have to be a partner. And you go into this frame of mind of okay, that's it. I'm, I'm done. They're not getting anything from me. I'm not talking to them. I'm not acknowledging them. And, and you stonewall and you, and you won't answer. Um, you won't communicate with them. You maybe even act like they're not even there. And I can tell you as someone who has family members who are, um, I have uh, two family members who are, who are stonewallers um, with each other. And when you are in an environment where people are stonewalling each other, it is really super uncomfortable. So it's sort of like the, the, you know, the elephant in the room and nobody's talking about it. Nobody's communicating with each other. And it's really very, very unhealthy for a relationship. So the antidote for stonewalling is to self-soothe. So that could be different for different people, right? So for some people, it may be going for a run or just going for a walk or, you know, going into the other room, you know, whatever it is to, to just, you know, stop the conflict, right? Take a break and go and calm down. And so that could be going out into nature. It could be deep breathing. I can tell you that, you know, deep breathing, taking, you know, even if you have to go into, if you're in a restaurant and you have to go into the restroom and sit there and take 10 deep breaths, that just taking those 10 deep breaths are, are going to send a signal to your central nervous system that it's time to relax and, and your body will respond by starting to relax. So that's, if you've ever seen people who are really, um, 
you know, maybe hyperventilating and they're really upset. It's like to try and calm down and slow down their breathing and focus on, you know, slowing down. So with stonewalling where you basically I equate it to like just becoming when you're flooded, frozen, you know, going and self-soothing, whether that's deep breathing, whether that's going for a walk, whether that's going out into nature, whether that's reading a book. My favorite, when I, when I get to a point where I'm emotionally flooded and I just can't communicate, you know what I mean? Maybe I can communicate, but I don't want to communicate. I'm just, you know, angry, upset, um, overwhelmed. Then I have a tendency to like do the dishes or, or clean the house, you know, to sort of, um, to distract myself from, from how I'm feeling. And that helps me, that helps me to calm down. And so whatever it is that will help you to de-escalate, then do that. But the, the, the most important point I think is that you're not doing that for days at a time or weeks at a time. I know people like the family members I mentioned where they would go for days, sometimes a week or more without communicating with each other. And so it's, you know, giving yourself enough time, but not, you know, maybe even agreeing upon a time, let's come back and discuss this tomorrow, or let's come back and discuss this later, like giving yourself enough time where you can come back and discuss it when you're more calm. And then the final for horsemen, the final communication style that is extremely damaging and the most damaging to any and all relationships is contempt. And that is where you are communicating with the individual, the loved one, whoever it is, in a way where you are putting yourself above that person, okay? And that can be done very overtly, right? Through, um, the worst way is through name calling, right? So if you are engaged in a relationship where you have the habit of, calling your partner or your loved one a name, like let's just use jerk, right? I mean, we can think of many other different variations of the word jerk, but we'll just use that. When you call somebody a jerk, you know, you're attacking their person. Again, just like criticism, you're attacking who they are. You're not addressing the issue. So why are they a jerk? What are they doing that is causing that person to be a jerk. And maybe you might think to yourself, well, they know why, why they're being a jerk. Like, I don't have to tell them why they're being a jerk, but it's in the communication, right? It's by calling them a jerk, you're attacking them as a person. And, and the better way is to say, you know, when you say, even if it's, let's say your partner is the one calling you a name, then you can say, you know, when you call me a jerk, that really doesn't feel good. And that hurts my feelings when you do that. So you're identifying the behavior and it's a much healthier way of communicating. Calling um, your partner or your loved one or anyone names is probably the, the worst um, and most destructive way of communicating. And it's something that will really lead to the breakdown of the relationship. But this contempt can be expressed in, in less overt ways, in subtle ways, like the lip curl, right? Or it could be communicated by, you know, many other body language positions like crossing your arms or a heavy sigh or, you know, giving your loved one the hand, like, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm done. I don't care about what you're, what you're saying. And that is, is just as damaging as well, because you, again, are expressing contempt. And I can tell you as, you know, someone who does a lot of um, marriage counseling, my husband and I actually do our marriage counseling together. Like we meet with, um, not between the two of us, but we, we um, meet with clients together because it helps the couple to feel supported when they have uh, a male and, and a female together. And so the point of that is that when we meet with um, a couple for counseling, one of the things that is very evident is that usually there's a lot of contempt that's going on back and forth, right? Or on one side more so than the other, but that is really what's causing um, a lot of damage to the relationship is the way in which 
they're communicating with each other. And so the antidote for that, and this, this slide shows you all the different problems that can come when somebody is treated with contempt. And that can be, you know, you could have grown up in an environment where your parents or, or other authority figures treated you with contempt. And generally, if you were treated that way or you're in a relationship where, um, where you're treated that way or you were in a relationship, it's generally going to create some significant feelings of internalized shame, which um, I have a video on, on shame that, that you can go ahead and watch that'll help you to learn more about that. This, the antidote for this particular horseman is to build a culture of appreciation and respect in order to counter the contempt. And I know that for people who are recovering from substance use issues, especially the family members, this can be really difficult. You know, it can be really hard to build that culture of appreciation. And for me personally, I think, I believe that practicing self-compassion and um, getting to a point where, where you can then practice compassion for your loved one. I think that all starts with having compassion for yourself. So practicing self-compassion and then, you know, doing your best to, to try to also um, extend that compassion to your loved one in and of itself is a way of building that culture of appreciation for each other. And this is a slide that just shows you the, the summary of the different, um, the different horsemen. Again, just going through it real quickly here, the criticism, we're attacking the character of the partner. And um, it's different from a complaint, which focuses on behavior. And then there's the defensiveness, self-protection and retaliation to ward off a perceived attack, shifting the focus away from the problem, onto the partner's flaws. The problem isn't me, it's you. Stonewalling, withdrawing from the interaction, shutting down or checking out, habitually avoiding conflict, turning away, acting busy or engaging in obsessive behaviors. And then contempt, treating the partner with disrespect and ridicule, thinking the other is lesser. Partner feels despised and worthless, using eye rolling, sarcasm, name calling, the single greatest predictor of divorce is contempt, just FYI. And this is just a summary of the antidotes, doing a physiological self-soothing for stonewalling, um, defensiveness, validating the feelings, saying I am feeling defensive, um, contempt, describe your own feelings and needs, criticism, the gentle startup. And this is the other piece of information that I think is so valuable. For me, this was a game changer when I learned this magic ratio. And so the magic ratio, again, is another piece of information that came out of the Gottman's research. And that is that for every one negative interaction that we have with our loved one, we need five to interact, to interact, to counteract that one negative. And when I first learned about this many years ago, when I did my very first training with um, the Gottman's, I... I was really like, um, it was sort of like an epiphany for me. I started to think about my relationships, especially my relationship with my, my sons. And I started to think about how often I communicate with them. And it's generally only about what they haven't done or what they're doing wrong or what they need to do better. Like, did you take out the trash? Why didn't you take out the trash? Did you do your homework? Why didn't you do your homework? Did you, you know, and then I started to think about how, well, how often do I then encourage them, you know, by complimenting them for things that they've done? And, and, and I know that some people will say, well, you shouldn't compliment, you know, people for things that they should be doing. And I say, why not? Like, you know, everyone likes to feel appreciated, right? So after that, learning about this, this ratio, I specifically started to, you know, have an awareness of making sure that I was saying more encouraging and positive things, not just communicating with them from this level of, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Um, and I noticed some people that might be like, oh, wow, but 
I really hadn't thought about it before until that moment. And so I started to say things to my sons like, wow, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you put that plate in the dishwasher and you didn't leave it in the sink, like little things, but boy, what a difference that made. So this is huge. And again, when I meet with people for, for counseling, for marriage counseling in particular, for couples counseling, for family counseling, generally the basis for a lot of the conflict is because this ratio is way out of whack, right? There's lots of negative interaction and communication taking place and not a lot of positive. There is a communication repair checklist that the Gottmans provide. And so I'm just going to go through a few of them with you. I provide in the description, there's a link for you to be able to download this PowerPoint and also to download a full, um, a full communication repair checklist, a, a separate download. So if you'd like to take advantage of that, just uh, click the link in the description, but just real quick, some some I feel statements. And so these are some examples for you of, of healthy ways to express how you're feeling. So things like, you know, please say that more gently when maybe somebody's using a, you know, a tone that doesn't quite feel um, very loving or kind, um, expressing, you know, I feel blamed. Can you, can you please rephrase that? I'm feeling very unappreciated. You know, please don't lecture me. That hurt my feelings. Being able to say, you know, how we feel, what we mean. Say what you mean, but don't say it mean. You know, tone is so important. Um, so more I feel statements. I feel criticized. Can you please rephrase that? Um, please don't withdraw. I'm getting worried. Then some I need to calm down statements. Um, please, please help me to calm down. You know, please be gentler with me. Um, can I take that back? I need your support right now. Some different examples of the, the need to calm down statements. I'm starting to feel flooded. Can we take a break? Some, some sorry statements. Let me try that again. I really blew that one. So when you're, when you can catch yourself, you know, when you're in the midst of maybe being defensive or expressing some contempt that you know wasn't really the right thing to say, being able to stop and say, you know what? I, I really blew that one. Let me try that again. I have this habit, have had this habit, and, and this happens, I think, frequently in relationships where substance use has been involved, is that I'll translate things based upon past traumas, right? So my husband has gotten into this habit throughout the years in our relationship when he thinks maybe I'm interpreting, which means that I'm hearing something completely different than what he's actually saying. So what he'll say to me is he'll say, tell me what you, what you think I just said, or tell me what you just heard me say. And then when I repeat it to him, he'll say, I didn't say that at all. I said something because we have traumas, you know, experiences in our lives that are laden with intense emotion. And sometimes when something feels a certain way, our brain will actually translate it in our mind and we'll think that we heard something that we really didn't hear. So that's really, and it's a thing, it really does happen. Some stop action statements. So let's take a break. Let's just stop here for a moment. I'm feeling flooded. You know, let's agree to disagree right now. Um, hang in there, you know, I want to change or I want to change the topic. Um, we're getting off track, I, maybe I'm wrong. And some getting to the yes statements. So let's find some common ground. Let's compromise. You know, I agree with part of what you're saying. I don't have to agree with everything. I agree with some of what you're saying. Um, I think your point of view makes sense. And some I appreciate statement, statements, okay? So really good appreciate state, statements for counteracting the negative, right? So um, I see your point. Thank you. I love you. I understand. That's a good point. One thing I admire about you, I'm thankful for. And then this final, this is one of the, the final points here is I highly recommend looking into um, more information about the five love languages. So, so there's the book, 
um, the five love languages that I, that I highly recommend. And learning what your love language is and what your partner's love language is will really improve your communication. Because for example, if my love language is different from one of my loved ones, love languages, then we could be totally miscommunicating because the way in which we interpret love is so different. So for example, one of my sons, the way in which he interprets love is through quality time. So you can see here on the screen, there's words of affirmation, physical touch, receiving gifts, quality time, acts of service. And quality time is the way in which he perceives and feels loved. And so I could give him tons of words of affirmation, but unless I'm spending significant time with him, doing things with him, he doesn't feel loved. So, so think about that. Like, you know, you think that you're doing so much for your loved one. And if they're not interpreting it as love or affection or care or whatever the case may be, then you're totally missing and that you're, you're miscommunicating. You're not connecting. So again, when you learn this and you can start to direct your behavior toward meeting the needs, the specific needs of your loved one, it can really transform your relationships. And then just real quick, I wanted to share with you that I have a free, free, absolutely free family training, which um, is seven different videos. It's a seven day free training. You register for the training and you'll get um, a video uh, each and every day. And it's topics that are relative to success, successful recovery from a substance use disorder as as the individual or the family member, just really uh, beneficial topics about recovery. And then if you're someone like myself who really, um, really loves like self-help information, I am somebody who like will go to the bookstore and like sit in the self-help section for hours, like looking through the different books and the information. Well, I created the Warrior Resource Library, which is um, a private portal that has hundreds of different videos, audios, PowerPoints, workbooks, worksheets of information relative to self-help. They're, they're relative to um, some information is very specific to addiction recovery, but then there's all sorts of information that is just you know to help people in general, like lots of mindfulness meditation information, um, information about the brain, about you know healthy relationships and so forth. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description for that. And then finally, there's, um, depending upon when you're watching this, uh, my next family recovery workshop, which is an intense, I call it an intense workshop because it's, it's live. It's not just, you're not just watching a video. This is, you know, interactive. I, I facilitate the, the groups, which are every week for six weeks for two hours. And um, it's experiential and there's lots of interaction between the participants. And it's the type of um, workshop where I have lots of variations of families that participate. So I'll have uh, a husband and wife. I'll have the, um, the parent and the adult child who has the substance use disorder or the adult child and the parent who has the substance use, substance use disorder. I'll have individuals that are just the family member participating on their own. And then just the individual who is recovering from the substance use disorder or has been recovered and just wants some more you know, intense like interaction and growth opportunity. So the next workshop starts on November 12th. And if it's beyond November 12th, if you click on the link in the description, I know it says click here, but if you click on the link in the, the description, it will give you the, um, the date of the next available workshop. So just some things that are available to you that you may want to take advantage of. So that's a wrap for this week's video. I hope you found that information to be helpful and please share it with those that you think may benefit. And if you have not subscribed yet to my channel, please click on the red subscribe link below. And when the bell pops up, if you click on the bell, you will be alerted to all of my upcoming videos. I post videos every single Monday. Hope to see you back here next time. In the meantime, have a beautiful and a blessed week. Namaste.